All right, guys, and we are back for part two of this week's Yawa. Yawa. If you didn't watch part one, you got to see why we're actually drinking fancy drinks tonight in fancy fancy glasses. glasses. So hop back, check out part one. Now, we're going to go ahead and get started with a few questions. Right after I mentioned to everybody that we went through the shirts, and I wrote this on that one, all of the smalls have been given out, so please stop sending me emails asking for the small shirts. They are gone. But I will say, in the process of finding the small shirts, we realized exactly we- five, five, yep. five large shirts. So the first five people that throw a comment down below, the first five, so check the comments to see if you are number six don't comment that you want a live shirt, if a large shirt, excuse me. But the first five that comment they want a large shirt, all we need to do is to comment, hey, I want the large shirt, and then uh, shoot us an email with your information and we'll go ahead and ship that out to you. They are the original Standing Stone Kennel t-shirts. All they are is gray and have white uh, information on them. So they're cool and they're the last five that exist in our house. In the world, probably. Well, that are brand new, available for people. Yes, in the world. <laughs> so get while well, the getting's good. Perfect. Let's move on First to some questions. First question from Mallory Pearson on Instagram. What was the point of the toes being tied up in your stories the other day? Desensitization question mark. Uh. And I love answering questions. That from people that are watching our Instagram stories because we put a lot of cool content on our Instagram stories showing training sessions and just the dogs being cute. And the fact that you're following along and have questions is great. So to break that down, what we're working on in those training sessions would be formal retrieving work. And in different parts of formal work, we try and break the steps down even more. Um, everything gets collar conditioned, and we put a lot of that collar conditioning where the dog wears the collar normally, which is on their neck. And if everything is taught and then introduced with neck collar pressure, basically, um, it can be a little confusing at times. So we try and break those sessions down. One of which is with uh, woe training, we utilize a belly collar when we start that formal work. And then with the retrieving work, We're actually using, they call it a toe hitch, and you're applying a little bit of pressure to their toes as a mild annoyance instead of collar pressure to make a very um, distinct understanding that all we're working on with this pressure is fetching. It doesn't mean come to me or heal or sit or anything else. It just means the only thing that we utilize that for is fetch work. So we can work through some reps. We can teach them how to shut off that pressure by reaching and grabbing something, and then we can make that transition to the collar. So that toe hitch is to be a baby step to all the ultimate end goal, which would be collar conditioning to fetch. It's, did you mention, I was reading, so if you did, just correct me, but did you mention it's a form of negative reinforcement? I didn't specifically mention that. No. Okay. We've had a lot of questions recently about like the toe hitches or our belly collars and neck pressure with healing. And I think that it would be a really good topic for us to go into depth about at another time on how those different things are utilized and why we utilize the pressure in those specific areas. So yeah, absolutely. Cause, um, there are, there are a lot of questions about why, why specifically there, why specifically that over something else. Yeah. So great question. And a lot of people have those similar style questions. So we will do another whole talk on that. Next question yeah. from James Schick, actually from our Patreon account. Hey, hey, hey. And he is able to actually ask us questions on Patreon, and we're going to give him a direct answer immediately. But he said this one would be a good one for Yawa. So I said, sure, let's do it on Yawa. First of all, thanks, James, for being a patron. Anybody that's interested in learning about what that is or have questions that don't actually get answered in this video this week, um, check out patreon.com slash standing stone kennels and you can join the community there. It's set up to be able to answer your questions on the daily. I'm talking, I mean, 99% of the time we're doing it every single day except for Sundays. And then also you have the ability to video your sessions. Yep. Set up a cell phone tripod or a human tripod, video those sessions, send them over. Kat and I will review them and get back to you on what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong and where you need to go from there. 
as well as, and this is a great place to just segue into this. Uh, there's also a level on our Patreon account for people that just want to support us and support the content that we're providing for them because we actually got a comment on one of our videos of Sprig in the field. Hey, you guys should get one of those fancy dancy gimbals for in the field so everything looks a little stabler. And that's great and we'd love to get one, but there is always a place and time and so much money to go around for new equipment and things like that. For sure, the stuff's uh, expensive. Yeah, so we'd love to get one so our, you know, field videos are that much smoother, but we got to put it in the budget. So, uh, all of the money that comes to us through Patreon goes directly back into creating more content for you guys. Yes. So, question for Yawa, what can we do to make the transition home from training? They've been following the Rogue and Quest videos, but any other suggestions? So this is a good question and something that when people send their dogs off for training for two to four months to six months to eight months of training, and they are ready to bring their dog home, a very, very important part of that process is spending time with us, enough time with us to go over everything your dog's learned in training and, and to, to feel, feel comfortable. comfortable. Yes. Jinx, you owe me something. Let me think. Mm, pop. I don't want any You pop. don't want pop. Um, no. You just think on that. Something, something, something. Anyway, um, so spending enough time to feel comfortable handling your dog using the e-collar. Uh, so your dog's just spent two to four months of training with us. They are very- Back rub. I want a back rub. Okie dokie. <laughs> uh, they are very, very conditioned at this point to do the behaviors that we're asking of them. So when mom and dad come to visit and they get their first excitement jitters out of the way, and then we start saying, okay, now we want to handle, want you to handle your dog. What happens is I say, okay, when you, for example, want Cody, which is your dog, James, to go onto your dog bed and you say, Cody, kennel, at the same time, I want you to press the vibrate button on your collar until the dog gets all the way on the bed. And you say, okay, got it. And then I go and you say, Cody, kennel. And I say, James, did you push the button? No, she just did it. Well, I'm glad she just did it this time for you in this controlled environment in a place that she's been training for the last four months. But I want you to feel comfortable, A, pushing the button. And I want you to feel comfortable if Cody doesn't do it to know how to handle that situation and know that when you get home and you're transitioning home and she's back into her old environment and you say, Hey, I want you to kennel. Um, and they don't, then you know how to push the button and how to get the compliance that we've taught over the last few months. Yeah. The thing is that dogs are very place and situationally oriented. So they cue more off of where they are and and around the situation that you're asking a lot of times more than the actual verbiage that you're using. Um, and that will, f you know, stand true to going home. They go home, they try and revert back to the things that they were doing when they were in that environment previously. And if you don't feel comfortable or you just go, yeah, yeah, I feel good. Yeah. Yeah. That's like a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I feel good. I feel comfortable. I don't need to work on this anymore. And you don't actually feel comfortable. Then you get home and you get lost and then stuff starts, starts to, fall to fall off. Apart. The wheels fall off. It starts to fall apart. Or everything's good for the for first a while. couple weeks because the dogs that have left from training have been so conditioned that they are pretty much automatic when they get home, but they haven't had the consistency then at home and the continued conditioning. And they're like, oh, well, I haven't felt the collar in a while. Maybe I really don't have to listen. Yeah. I wonder what would happen if I don't listen. And then they start pushing the envelope and then that's when the issues start arising. So. And every dog's personality is a little bit different yeah. and that's going to change because there are people that say, oh, well, my dog never questions anything anymore. Well, there are dogs like that. There are people like that. But then there are also dogs and, and people that question everything always, every second they get a chance. And that takes more conditioning. When the dogs leave our program, there's been a ton of generalization. They've been handled by multiple people. They have a really, really, really good understanding of exactly what they're supposed to do. And they will be borderline automatic for a while. And then when they start to figure out what they can and can't get away with, that's when some of the problems start to come back. Yes. So I would just recommend setting aside enough time 
becoming as involved in the send home process as you can. Don't just sit with your hands in your pocket and observe and not put your hands on the situation. And um, for the and average ask person, questions. yeah, ask questions for the average person. That's a few hours um, yes. to half a day. Um, we've had people to stay upwards of a couple days where they did some work in the morning and then came back the next morning because there's only so much work that your individual dog can do in a day um, before we start causing issues. But uh, that was a little bit excessive. You know, that was a situation when someone that had, you know, there was their first bird dog, was their, they're getting into hunting, they needed help with all the things. And if that's you, we're happy to help you that way. Um, and if this is your second dog and you just need a little refresher with things or, or whatever. Or you've had multiple dogs trained by us in the past. Yep. You've, you're very familiar with the way that we handle, the way that we train, and that process is usually going to go a little bit quicker. But 100%. It's a really great question, James. What do we got next? Next is from Sal394 on Instagram. Hey, Sal. How far apart do you typically set launchers? Mm. This is a good one because it depends. <laughs> we set them as far apart as each individual's specific dog needs. Um, and that the, always sounds like a cop-out answer because we use that similar que- like answer a lot. Well, it depends on your dog and every dog's different. Well, that's because they are. They're all different. So if we were to set up, let's go through a couple examples. If we were to set up for a little puppy, I'm talking it's their first opportunity on birds. They've done the things. They're ready for it. And they're, let's say, four to six months old. Because we may get a bird on launchers somewhere between four and six months old. If it's Yeah, like with one of our personal puppies, like yep. Thunder. Um, and you go on a normal walk with them, and they're good at ranging out in the vicinity of 10 to 20 yards, that course is going to have to be pretty small. Because they're going to also lose focus yep. fairly quickly. Now, the dog is a little older, let's say six to eight months old, and they're fine running bigger. And bigger doesn't always have to do with it, but they cover a lot more ground because they have longer legs and they're more mature. They're bigger dogs. And they're dogs. focused between birds for longer. Yep. Um, you're going to be able to extend those distances out to... Let's say it takes you about 15 to 20 minutes to walk a three to four bird loop back to the truck. We usually set in circles because we're typically running multiple dogs. And then you end up back at the truck when you're done to get the next dog to move on. So your loop would end up being somewhere in that 10 to 20 minute range, depending on the dog. And then when you get to more of a level of a finished dog, we start really spreading those birds out. So it's going to be a more realistic hunting type of situation. And even to the extent of sometimes we set in clusters where. Yes, I was just going to say that sometimes we'll set. And usually we're past the point of launchers by that time. Yes. And we'll put a bird and then very quickly thereafter another bird so that. that we're talking dog's... within like 50 yards maybe yeah. or even less, you know, so bird, bird, and then nothing. And they've got to run and spend 10, 15 minutes hunting they're, where they're not going to really find anything. And then, who? there's another little cluster of birds because that's a pretty realistic hunting situation. Um, never, unless you, not never, usually unless you go to that preserve hunting situation is there not one bird every 40 yards in the field and you keep Yeah, and sometimes you going. need to stretch them out a little bit more too, so that that dog understands that they have to work for it and we don't lead them into each launcher. They are actually independently yep. searching productively to find birds. That's an absolutely fantastic point because when we set our course, we typically utilize the wind to the puppy's advantage. So if we've got a general direction we're going to be working, um, we have some some mode paths that we kind of stay on unless the puppy gets clung to the path, but it keeps... Um, you know, from completely tearing up a field if all of the motorized four-wheelers, whatever, go down the same paths. And then we set birds on the, you know, upwind side. So the wind is blowing to the puppy in the easiest scenario. And then when we get to those more advanced dogs, we we specifically set the birds on the downwind side, which is going to force them to be working away from the paths in order to even have an attempt to find the birds. Yep. And then if we get to the point where we're working with maybe even an older dog that is struggling to get out and hunt and they, you know, they're really pumped up right when they get on a bird and then that drive and desire goes down and they start plodding along and walking in front of you or walking behind you. um, We need to adjust the way that we're setting launchers as well to help build momentum and you know, keep them excited about the task and let them know what the purpose is. Sometimes that will happen with dogs. 
even if they've had a great start, uh, they go hunting for a year or two and the bird numbers and opportunities have been down because it's a bad year. And then the dog goes, this is a lot of work for a lot of nothing. And they get bored with it or tired of it. And they don't see the reward in continuing to hunt and work hard. Um, And then we need to bring that back into focus for them. Now, two things with that, I would say one of which to touch on your hunting comment, because it's very, 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 very true. Um, That also falls into some of our mature dogs. Um, And then this comment falls right into the next, which finding birds is in essence a form of variable reinforcement because the amount of time in between each reinforcer, which is the bird, um, changes. And it's not always, it's actually, it's usually never the same. And, you know, you have to find what that limit is of how often the puppy needs that reinforcement in training to be able to continue to stay focused and continue to drive on. Now, even our Finnish dogs hunt a lot in South Dakota and we'll have a dry spell where it'll be, we may walk this, um, shelter belt, which I always, uh, and any of the guys that come and hunt with me, will know it's like, how long is this shelter belt we're walking? Oh, it's just up the hill. You know, it's two miles long. Okay. That's a ways. And you start at one end and you push to halfway and then you start it and then you push to the next half and it's a long way. And there may be, um, with wild birds, I mean, you never have any idea where they're truly at. You've got some general ideas, but they're where they are. And when you find them, you do well. And when you don't find them, you find very little. And so even my seasoned dogs that walk that two mile stretch, if it's a dry stretch that day that we hunt it, I mean, there's, you get about 75% of the way down and we've now spent nearly an hour without a bird and they're on the ground they start maybe looking for some mice. I see a point and I'm like, whoo. And then I see a little mouse go and they kind of, you know, so some mousing can happen even with those more or distractedness can happen with some of those more seasoned dogs because they all have their limit and they want to hunt something. And when they're only finding this off game, that can sometimes be it. And in that situation, we redirect focus. Hey, 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 come on, move on, get out of here. And then you can tell what the mouse point looks like and the bird point looks like. And you just redirect focus off of those so or the porcupine point. or the porcupine point or the rabbit point um but i have seen or the skunk or the skunk point i've seen some dogs that have some pretty dang uh staunch convincing rabbit points before been in hunting with them and walk in to kick out a rabbit it's like you knucklehead what are you doing I don't think that we have time for another question in this section. Ah. Sorry, guys. We will get to more questions in part three, but thank you for watching part two. We're going to take a short break, and we will be right back. 